Excellent. Yeah, well, thanks for that great introduction. I appreciate it a lot. Um, so I'm Michael Morgan. This is Lee Harper. I think most people know Lee uh, fairly well. He's been involved with birds for quite some time. Um, so we're going to try to tag team this a little bit. We're going to go uh, bounce back and forth, sharing some information about birds along the St. Lawrence River. Okay. Um, so our talk is about uh, St. Lawrence River fowl. Uh, or to keep with the avian theme of the talk, it's going to be a quick flyby of some bird conservation projects and successes uh, in the St. Lawrence River. Uh, we do have a whole bunch of uh, petroglyphs here to, to share with you guys, so um, bear with us. We try to stick more with pictures than actual writing, so hopefully it's somewhat enjoyable. Um, so we can't talk about bird conservation on the St. Lawrence River without recognizing some of the landscape level changes that have taken place. The, the talks beforehand were great to kind of set the stage and to highlight some of the discussion and, and also controversy associated with the, the changes to the St. Lawrence River. Um, the dam itself is not the only factor that influences bird populations along the river, um, but it is a key influence that's impossible uh, to ignore. Um, and not just the dam itself, as we talked about, there's the, the COA construction and then there's the industry that uh, spring up as a result of uh, the, that construction as well. Uh, but the, the dam was relicensed in 2003, you probably know a lot of the details about that. Um, and it was an incredible opportunity to align conservation efforts and to re, uh, just kind of redevelop some of the, the initiatives that go along with bird conservation along the St. Lawrence River, as well as fish and other wildlife as well. Uh, for me personally, getting involved with the, the uh, projects that were associated with relicensing is kind of a once in a lifetime opportunity to make, uh, to have an impact on the habitats and populations along the river for, for a, about a 50 year term, hopefully much longer than that, um, but, uh, but at least for 50 years or so. Um, another alternative title for our talk is it's not just big water and big fish. I'm really looking forward to the next couple of talks. Or we'll talk about big fish, I believe, um, but there's a lot of other wildlife along the river uh, beyond just, just the fish itself. Um, so when you're talking about the St. Lawrence River and the habitats that are in context with the river, uh, some things make a lot of sense. Common loons are pretty obvious. Uh, osprey uh, are pretty obvious. Uh, there's eagles, there's a bunch of other birds that you would think about when you're driving along looking at the river, and we'll talk about some of those a little bit more. You probably also think about ducks and geese. Uh, the, 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 the term we give to that group of birds is waterfowl. They, they need water, right? There's a bunch of other wildlife that require uh, habitats along, along the river as well. Um, so here's one. Uh, there's a sparrow on the left, a uh, bobolink on the right. Uh, uh, there's a few others. Meadowlarks uh, are another species um, that, that we're pretty interested in. These birds that I'm showing you, they're part of a group called grassland birds. You probably know of forest birds, marsh birds, waterfowl, things like that. There's a whole group of wildlife called grassland birds that are very important uh, in their own right. Uh, there's 12 species in New York State that are considered to be grassland birds. Um, the, the three I've showed you, there's a few different sparrows, there's an upland sandpiper, uh, uh, and, a few, uh, a couple, and there's an owl species and a few others as well. Um, but these, these are the birds that require grassland landscapes in order to, to survive. They require grassland habitats for their entire life cycle, not just for a portion of the life cycle like things like turkeys and waterfowl might use, but they, they need grasslands for their, for their entire life cycle. Um, uh, these 12 species, unfortunately, are doing the worst of all the bird habitat groups in New York State and uh, across the Northeast. Um, uh, all these species are, are having some pretty significant declines. Uh, the, there's one species called the loggerhead shrike. It used to be a pretty common breeder in New York State. It's now extirpated as a breeder in New York State. Um, and so the next species that's, uh, or the, the next rare species of the grass and birds in New York State is called the henslow sparrow. There's probably fewer Henslow sparrows left breeding in New York State than there are of any other bird uh, that I can think of. Lee, feel free to correct me if I'm, if I'm forgetting any. Uh, so Henslow sparrows now have the dubious distinction of being the grass and bird species uh, in the worst condition here in New York State. And there might be fewer of them even here than, than Bicknell's Bignall, thrush, which is another uh, bird that's been getting some attention. So in terms of grass and bird conservation in New York State and why we care here in the St. Lawrence, uh, this is a map that the various partners associated with grass and bird conservation have done to try to target areas in New York State where we can focus our efforts for conserving grass and birds in their habitat. Now you can see the largest one is up along the northern uh, edge of New York State, and that's the St. Lawrence River focus area. Um, and while there's quite a bit of New York State included in these focus areas, uh, the St. Lawrence River focus area really is the most important one. It has the highest diversity of grass and birds, the highest populations of many of the rare, uh, the rarest grass and bird species, and so it is really important, uh, uh, and it's, so it is very important for that, for that reason. 
Uh, I mentioned Henslow sparrows briefly. Uh, this is a map just from last year showing where Henslow sparrows were found in New York State during the breeding season. There's only, only four locations where they were found in New York State. Uh, there were a couple birds down near Ithaca, a single bird down in the Hudson Valley, uh, another bird over near Albany, New York. But then there's a cluster of locations up near Watertown where, where Henslow sparrows were found. Uh, this is a, a zooming in a little bit more. Uh, so most of the locations in New York State only had one or two Henslow sparrows. Up here we had clusters of four, five, six or more Henslow sparrows in this relatively small area. So pretty important uh, habitat for Henslow sparrows here in, here in the North Country. So you're probably thinking, yeah, those are here in the North Country. They're not really river associated the way you might be thinking. So, so why am I talking about them? Well, just trying to set the stage for, for why grassland birds are important and why we care about them uh, along the river. So going back to some of the, some of the old uh, planning and efforts that uh, occurred for this, the COA construction, um, I think this island was mentioned at one point. This is, this is Gallup Island, uh, north of Lisbon, New York, uh, near uh, Cardinal, Ontario. Uh, this map is from some of the flow modeling that was done just uh, prior to the COA construction. You can see there's a, a cluster of islands uh, on the east side there. Um, I think there's 11 different islands prior to, to COA construction. Uh, so that's Gallup Island. I took that same outline and overlaid it over a, a Google Earth map of that island today. You can see that the, 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 the nature of the island or the shape of the island itself was changed pretty dramatically. There's that canal that was dredged right through the, uh, more or less the middle of the island and a bunch of spoils and dredged um, materials were also dumped on the remaining islands to, to dispose of that material. Uh, so what that is, that creates a pretty neat opportunity for, for grass and birds specifically. The material that was dumped as dredge spoils is pretty poor soil. Uh, vegetation does not grow particularly well. It does grow, but it's kind of sparse, it takes some time. That ends up being ideal conditions for a, a lot of the grass and bird species. Uh, so we're pretty excited to be doing some work at Gallup Island. It's a very large island now that it's one big, one big patch of dirt. Um, the grass and birds are all very area sensitive. Things like Henslow Sparrow really require a couple hundred acres or more of open space to, to be able to uh, effectively breed. Uh, so locations like Gallup Island are, fan are a fantastic opportunity to use um, what's there uh, to try to maintain habitat or improve habitat for, for a species that really needs it. So Gallup Island is, is just one location. There's a whole series of locations up and down the river with either similar, similar conditions or where similar uh, management is, is occurring. These are just some of, the key point, uh, some of the key locations from Point Peninsula all the way downstream to, to Gallup Island, White House Point, Ogden Island, and then at Wilson Hill we have some grassland habitat as well. Uh, so that's just a real quick snapshot of grassland birds along the St. Lawrence River. I'm going to turn the microphone over to, to Lee to talk about turns. Got time for a few more minutes? <laughs> Excellent. Another hour, right? Uh, <laughs> sure. So uh, uh, Lee mentioned osprey at one point uh, during his talk, uh, some of the issues associated with nesting osprey. I had this map from another talk and I wanted to, to show it real quick. Uh, this is the Lake St. Lawrence section of the St. Lawrence River showing three platforms that were put up for osprey in 2005. 2006 was the first nesting season the osprey could use those platforms. Only one of them was occupied by osprey in 2006. Uh, and then this past year, uh, the green triangles are platforms for osprey, the red are a few of the other osprey nests in the area. It just shows you in about a little over 10 years, the osprey population in the Lake St. Lawrence region has really uh, exploded, uh, for better or for worse. Um, those green platforms themselves, since the platforms have been installed, they've uh, fledged over 90 osprey chicks in the past 11 years. Uh, so pretty significant uh, improvement to their, to their population. I really wanted to highlight Wilson Hill. If you give me a, just a few more minutes, I'll, I'll hit on Wilson Hill and the habitats there uh, real quickly. Um, Wilson Hill is where we base our operations uh, on when we're working on the river. Uh, it's a wildlife management area just west of Messina. Um, Wilson Hill was established in, in the 1950s when the seaway and the power dam was constructed. Uh, this aerial photograph is from, I think, 1958. Kind of shows you what it looked like right when they're beginning to flood. Not the greatest picture, I know. Uh, but here's a more, a more recent picture from uh, 2012, I believe, showing the, the large open areas of wetland that are part of Wilson Hill Wildlife Management Area. You can see some of the dikes and the various impoundments or pools that we manage as wetlands at Wilson Hill. Um, there's about 2,400 acres of wetlands at Wilson Hill. Uh, and as you can see from the picture, it, it's mostly open water. Op there's, uh, there's, about, there's tens of thousands of, of acres of open water on the St. Lawrence River itself. Uh, so when the relicensing occurred, uh, for the power dam, uh, we really looked for some opportunities to try to improve the, the wetlands of Wilson Hill and try to manage them in a little different condition than, uh, than the wetlands in the, in the river itself. 
Um, so um, not, not to say that the wetlands of Wilson Hill weren't good habitat. Uh, these are pictures of some of the diving ducks uh, that staged at Wilson Hill prior to migration. Uh, the picture on the left shows them pretty clearly. I don't know if you can see it on the picture on, on the right. Um, there's two different flocks of, of just thousands of diving ducks that are uh, exploiting the, the wetlands of Wilson Hill um, prior to migration. There are species that likes open water and, uh, and they did benefit somewhat from, from Wilson Hill. Uh, Wilson Hill also has a long history with Canada geese. I know they're kind of a nuisance for most people. Um, Wilson Hill is one of the sites where, can, where the resident geese were, were restored back in the, in the 50s and 60s. Uh, but it's also a site where there's been a long running uh, volunteer, primarily volunteer effort to ban banned Canada geese, and that's been going on since the 60s to track how that population has changed. If you haven't participated in the Wilson Hill Goose Drive, you're all invited. It's a fantastic, uh, really fun uh, adventure, uh, excursion, a chance to hold, hold geese, put bands on, let them go. If you haven't done it, you should try it at some point. So Wilson Hill had these large open areas of water. It was great for some diving ducks, great for Canada geese. There are still some areas that weren't uh, really managed to, to, the best, to their best potential. Um, Part of it was just a little bit of a handicap with managing, managing the water levels. Uh, during the relicensing, we were able to get the power authority to build us uh, five new water control structures. Uh, four dikes uh, were built and three other dikes were rehabilitated to help manage the water a little more act effectively. Uh, 180 acres of new wetland was impounded. And then the keystone or capstone of the whole project was, was the pump house at Wilson Hill. Um, this is a picture of the inside showing these two massive pumps. Um, each, each one of those pipes is a 24 inch diameter pipe, allows us to move a lot of water at Wilson Hill. So uh, what do we do with it? Um, it's probably counterintuitive, but the first thing we did was to take water away from Wilson Hill. Uh, this is a picture of, of Bradford Pool, one of the smaller wetlands at Wilson Hill. And what we were able to do for the first time in 2014 was to pump it, uh, pump it mostly free of water, not completely. What it did is it exposed the sediments that are at the, ba the bottom of the wetlands there to, to air and to sunlight. Uh, wetland soils will uh, uh, contain uh, viable seeds that will germinate for decades after they've uh, uh, laid to rest there. By exposing it to air and a little bit of warmth, all those seeds can germinate. So there's a picture on the left of shortly after uh, the water was down and the vegetation was growing. Picture on the right was the, uh, just a trail cam that we put out to kind of get a time-lapse time picture. The next picture we have is just a solid wall of green where the vegetation grew in and, and blocked the camera. Uh, and then later in the fall, we were able to re-flood that and provide some great habitat. So this is what it looked like prior to that project, the open water that was um, there in the pool. Uh, and this is what it looks like now. You can see the change in the vegetation, the habitat, as a result of that aggressive water level uh, management. So it looks like cattail. Cattail is not always the greatest habitat for a lot of things. There's a lot of issues with really dense cattail along some of the wetlands along the river. Um, one thing that's pretty exciting about this is it's, uh, it's a new stand of cattail. It's, it's the native variety of cattail. It's not the hybrid or the invasive, if you know much about that but it creates what we call hemi marsh. It's a pretty even mixture of water intermixed with, uh, with the vegetation. And as you paddle through it, it almost, it barely slows you down. You can paddle right through it, but it creates great habitat, great structure for things like bitterns, rails, grebes, um, you name it. Uh, one thing that was pretty exciting when we first surveyed the vegetation this, this past summer is can you see the, the nest in the middle of the picture there? Not very, not very obvious, it's circled right there. Uh, this is a new species for us at Wilson Hill. Uh, black terns. Black terns uh, are closely related to common terns. They nest in a little bit different habitat. Rather than nesting on rock and gravel, they like to nest on floating mats of cattail or other vegetation out in the marshes. We've done surveys for black terns prior to all the, the changes to kind of document that they weren't there. We we're very excited to see them show up uh, this past year at Bradford Pool. Um, so, uh, and they're, they're a great indicator species too. They, they really indicate the quality of the habitat. We've done surveys for, for rails, for bitterns, for uh, least bitterns and American bitterns and a whole variety of marsh uh, wildlife and uh, it's very exciting to go out to these these stations or these locations where it was just open water before no birds were documented then in the succeeding years uh, start to really see good numbers of these uh, species benefiting from the habitat so uh, my closing statement I guess is uh, uh, these are just a few of the projects that are underway to improve fish and wildlife uh, along the St. Lawrence River that, that we're involved in there's a lot of other projects underway um, and it's pretty, so it's pretty exciting to think about how these habitats will be here for a, a long period of time. But things like this, we can't just 
make the change and just sit back and, and, and enjoy it from that point on. It requires constant uh, water level management, habitat management, and especially invasive species management. We've really enjoyed participating or partnering with uh, Save the River and some of the volunteer monitoring projects that, to help get eyes out on the river looking for things like common turn nets or looking for new uh, in infestations of invasive species. So we're very excited about that, that partnership, hopefully for the next 50 years if Save the River is still around. Uh, so I'm going to... Uh, I'm going to wrap up with that. I think we'll open up for questions, right, Lou?